name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now, it's good to see you here in the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. It's always good to meet in the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. And it's good to see you. We have some visitors. We're delighted to have our visitors. Always glad to have people to visit with us here at Northside. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour we can be an inspiration to you. I'm sure what Paul has lined up for us to be a blessing to our hearts and then we'll be preaching to you from the Word of God. And out in the radio listening audience, if you have a phone nearby, why don't you just call someone and have them to tune in and get this hour coming up. I do believe we can be a blessing to many shut-ins and people that's not in God's house today. And you'll be doing them a favor, you'll be doing us a favor. If you call them, have them tune in the station where you're now listening. Now at this time, we'll turn the service over to Paul. He'll direct the song service. And I'm sure what he has lined up for us will be a blessing to our hearts. So Paul, at this time. Get your hymnal, turn to page 143. Singing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to two places in the Word of God. I want you to turn to Malachi chapter 3 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I want to say to you out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate you listening to this broadcast. And if you're not getting the daily broadcast, then tune in each day at 12 o'clock noon to the station where you're now listening and you get the daily broadcast. I want to say also this will be the last time I'll make mention of the Holy Land tour this year. Time is running out. We have about uh, maybe uh, 12 or 14 more days, and then the deadline will be there uh, for the trip. And if there's anyone listening today and you'd like to make this trip with us, you have almost two weeks to get in touch with me. And it is a wonderful tour. We go into Jordan and from Georgia into Israel, from Israel into uh, Egypt, from Egypt into Austria. Be a 10 day trip, be away one weekend. And it's a wonderful trip. If you've never seen the beautiful desert from Jerusalem down to Egypt, it might be well worth your trip to see that beautiful desert, uh, pl uh, plus the other places, the museum in Egypt, where we'll see many things taken out of the tomb of old King Tut, including a coffin, a golden coffin, weighing more than 240 pounds, and other wonderful sights on this trip. And if you're thinking about going, you've been praying about going, uh, then you need to get in touch with me within the next two weeks because the deadline will be up and this will definitely be 
the last time I'll make mention of this tour this year. Now you pray for me and write to me and stand by this home mission work. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. Now I do hope you have your Bible open at the last book in the Old Testament, chapter 3. In Old Testament days, they had uh, storehouses where the farmers would store their fruit when they would uh, store fruit in these storehouses. They would give a tenth of that fruit and bring it in. They didn't have, didn't earn money in those days like you do today, have uh, salaries. And they relied upon their vineyards, upon their uh, uh, crops of wool and things of that type and things to eat and wear. And in order for livelihood, they had money to be sure, but they didn't have salaries like you have today. As a general rule, to give a tenth of your salary into the God's work, they gathered their fruit out of their farms and things that they accumulated by their animals and selling the animals and so forth. They would bring that into this uh, storehouse and to use that storehouse back before the uh, God established the New Testament church and they'd come and store their food and the people would bring in a tenth of their income. God said if you do that, he'd bless them because a tenth of it belonged to him. That was the tithe and they would do that. They'd have the blessings of God upon them and then that food was taken and used to take care of the needy to do what need to be done in respect to the work of God. In this day, we have uh, churches where people have their salaries, their income. They come in, they bring their tithes or their gifts and offerings and give it to spread the gospel to do the work of God. Same principle runs all the way through the Old and the New Testament. Now in Malachi chapter 3, let's see what God had to say about those people in Old Testament days. Look at verse 7. Even from the days of your fathers, you're going away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and in offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now here, which saith the Lord of hosts, if I will open the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that you shall not be room enough to receive it. I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not devour the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, but ye shall be a delightful land, saith the Lord of hosts. Now that's reading from Malachi chapter 3, verses 7 through 12, or 7 through 11 rather. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, now the first day of the week is Sunday of course, Upon the first day of week of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. Now here he says, for his people, every born-again Christian that has an income, he is obligated to lay by in store or give on the first day of the week his tithes and his offerings to support the work of God. Now that tithe is one dime out of a dollar. An offering or a gift is everything you give above that. The tithe belongs to the Lord. Uh, said an English nobleman on one occasion, he said, uh, What I spent, I had. What I kept, I lost. What I gave, I have. Now he said that just before he died and how true that is. I'm going to speak today on the matter of Christian giving to encourage you this year to do your part in this respect and then you'll have the blessings of God upon you and you'll be far better off at the end of 1983 if you will do this than you will if you don't do it. Now God cannot lie. God said try me, prove me and see what I'll do about this and see if I won't do what I promised you I'll do. Now we need to obey the Lord. 
I have no time to waste on people that argue about the matter of Christian giving and feel like they're not obligated to give. Uh, we are obligated to give according to the Bible. Someone said God made the sun and it gives. God made the moon, it gives. God made the stars, they give. God made the air, it gives. God made the clouds, they give. God made the earth, it gives. God made the sea, it gives. God made the trees, they give. God made the flowers, they give. God made the fowls, they give. God made the beasts, they give. God made the plan, he gave. God made man, he gave. Well, I want to encourage you in respect of Christian giving that you'll obey the Lord, have God's blessings on you, and you can be happy as you sojourn throughout this year. Now, when you give as a Christian, you're doing what God expects of you. You may say, now, preach, Edwards, does God expect me to give if I'm a born-again Christian? He certainly does. Now, God's business is the greatest business in all the world. And God has a divine plan devised to operate his business financially. And that's through the tithes and the offerings and gifts of his children. John West is the great man of God of many years gone by. John West has said, get all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. And of course, do that honestly, do that according to the Bible. Now, secondly, you are giving God that that rightly belongs to Him. If this ever dawns upon you, you'll be different and have a different attitude about your giving if you don't already have the right attitude. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 27, and verse 30, the Bible said, All the tithes of the land, whether of the seed of the land, or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Now that did not cease to be true in the Old Testament. That is also true in the New Testament. The principle of the tithe runs all the way through the Bible. Even in the Garden of Eden, God said, I'm putting some trees in the garden. And he said to Adam and Eve, of all the trees, you can eat the fruit except one. That one tree is mine. Keep your hands off of it. That's mine. But they went ahead uh, through the encouragement of the devil and ate of that tree. And that's why we're in the mess we're in today, sin-wise. Now, God has a claim on a portion of your income as a Christian. One dime out of every dollar that comes your way is the Lord's. It's not yours. 90% of it is yours. 90 cents out of a dollar is yours. One dime is God's. If you're a born-again Christian, God has laid claim on that. That is no more yours than you'd come and, and take money out of somebody else's pocket that belongs to them and claim it for yourself. God has trusted you and honored you, and God expects you to do that which is right and give him that that rightly belongs to him. Let him have his own. That belongs to God anyway. As a born-again Christian, what you should do when you receive your income, whether it be weekly, daily, monthly, or uh, semi-annual, or annually, how often you receive your income, you should take out God's tithe first. That's the Lord's. That's not yours. And if you will do that, God will in turn take the 90% you have left or the 9 tenths you have left, and God will bless that and stretch that and use that and you'll be more able, you can do far more with the 90% or 9% than you could if you kept the 10%. Kept it all for yourself. That's a principle in the Bible. It's proven true. And men have tried it. God said, prove me and try me and see if I'm not telling you the truth. Number three, when you give of your tithes and your offerings and your gifts, you're opening up the way for spiritual progress in your life. In Matthew chapter, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 12, And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. I've been preaching the gospel now for uh, more than 40 years. I have dealt with a lot of people in my lifetime. I've preached a lot of people. I've dealt with a lot of uh, saved people. And I have never yet, are you listening to me? I have never yet, been able to develop a saved person spiritually 
that rebel against Christian giving. They just don't grow and you don't develop them. And eventually they'll wind up amounting for nothing for God. And many times God has to in turn operate upon them to collect and set them straight. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 7, Therefore as you abound in everything in faith and utterance, and knowledge and in all diligence and love and love to us see that you abound in this grace also now what grace he talking about he's talking about the grace of Christian giving God said you abound in the matter of your Christian giving I've known some millionaires that started out with nothing that tie their income and now they're giving 90% to God and keeping 10% and have more money to spend than they know what to do with there was a little boy one time by the name of William. William's father was very poor. And he said to his son, he said, Son, I, I want you to go out and see if you can find a job. And see if you can make a little money to help us along the way. We are poor. We are in great need. Little 16-year-old William went out and he talked to a canal captain down near the waterfront about a job. That canal captain said to William, said, uh, William, I'm going to give you a job, but I'll tell you what I want you to promise me. He said, son, what can you do? He said, I can uh, uh, make soap and I can build candles. That was a good job in those days. This captain said, now, William, if you make soap, I'm going to ask you to do this. I'll give you a job, providing when you make a cake of soap, you make a full bar. Don't you cheat anybody. You be sure that that bar of soap is in its fullness, a full 100% bar of soap. And not only that, William, I want you to give 10% of every dime you make, every dollar you make to God. He said, if you'll promise me you'll do those two things, you've got a job. He said, sir, I promise you. You know who that man was? William Colgate. The man that's uh, produced all the Colgate products in the land, in the world today. Became a multi-millionaire. But he started out by making a full bar of soap and giving God 10% of his income. Look what God did for him. Many years ago, there's a businessman over here at Tacoma named Laterno. Laterno. Laterno was a businessman. He started out in his business. He said, I'm going to give God 10% of my income. And he did. And he began to increase that. And he became a millionaire. And the last account I had of Laterno, he was giving God 90% of his income. And he was keeping 10% had more money than he knew what to do with. Now God is true and you can't outdo God. God won't let you outdo him. The more you give to God, the more he's going to give back to you more ways than a country boy and go to town. Now there's many ways God can bless you. He can make your shoes last long, your clothes last longer. Keep him having a toothache while you have to have a tooth pull. And God can make the automobile tires last long, keep the automobile. There's many things that God can do for you that you don't realize he's doing it for you. And help you along the way. Now God wants us to realize that tithing is not a financial problem. But there's no need of anybody saying, I'm not able. If they have an income, it's not a, a financial problem. It's a spiritual problem. When people don't want to tithe, it's a spiritual problem. Not a financial problem. You, you do what God said to do and you'll be better off financially. Many of you heard me give the story. And I won't give the full story today because like a time in Radford, Virginia. There's a man in that church that robbed God and every time the preacher mentioned money he got mad as a devil, spewed demons all over the church and raised Cain all during the day because the preacher mentioned money. He had a boy about 18 years old is mean, the meanest boy in the community. He wouldn't mind breaking up people's windows, tearing down the shrubbery. He was mean as the devil wanted him to be. Couldn't get him to church. One Sunday morning somebody preached on tithing and Christian giving Lord the boom on that old man. And he saw what he'd been doing, realized his mistake, came down to the altar, got right with God, began to weep, asked God to forgive him about his attitude toward Christian giving. Got up and apologized to the church, asked the church to forgive him. That very night, that man's son came to church, heard the gospel, and when the invitation was given, he was the first man down that aisle to get right with God. What are you saying, preacher? That old codger... Because of his attitude toward Christian giving, it kept his son out of the family of God. And if he'd have gone on like that, that boy might have gone to hell. Now, if you don't believe you can lock up the blessing of God Almighty in your home, in your life, in your business, if you don't believe that, you better clean out your ears and listen to this preacher today 
And let me have your ears for a few minutes and tell you what God says in this book. You can lock up the blessings of God Almighty by becoming a God robber. You certainly can. That's the man young in Greenwood, South Carolina. God, I'll tell you, I wish to the Lord I could, I had the time to tell you about this old gentleman. How God blessed him when he was a tither. And then one day when he failed to give his, his, of his tithes, a storm came up and, and, and threw down the, the uh, business he had where he made his money. His chicken house, killed his chickens, burst his eggs. And he knew why. When he went home, he knew why. God spoke to him and said, well, you promised me if I would bless you, you'd pay your debts and, and you'd tithe your income and you didn't do it today. And the old man had to go out and, and gather his chickens up that the storm didn't kill, that burst his eggs. It took him a long time to get on top again. But he said, I learned a lesson. I learned to obey and, bless, and pay my tithes and give up my gifts and offer. I'll never rob God anymore. That old gentleman learned the lesson. He learned it the hard way. You're building a wall against the devourer whenever you tithe. You may say, preacher, what do you mean? That God said, I rebuke that devourer for your sake. God said to those farmers in the Old Testament, he said, now if you're a tithe, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll keep the, the, the uh, beetles away from your fruit. I'll keep the insects out of your gardens. I'll, I'll keep the insects away from your grapes and corn and wheat. And, and you'll have a better crop if you're a tithe. I'll keep the devourer away from your crops. And those that tithe, they experience it. But when they backstood on God and quit tithing, God just let the beetles and the bugs and the bull weevils and everything else that came along destroy their crops. Because they didn't tithe. Now the devourer took over whenever they forgot God. Now as certain as I'm speaking to you today, you can keep the devourer away from your house. You can do it by obeying God and tithing of your income and giving of your gifts and offerings. Who said so? God. You believe God? Is he all right? God said it. I believe God. And God is always right. And then not only will you keep the fire away from your house by obeying the Lord, but you can unlock the windows of heaven and God can pour you out a blessing that you couldn't receive otherwise. God just unlocked the heavens and the blessings come. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, Prove me now here with saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God said, if you don't believe I'll let try me. I'll just open up the windows and dump it out to you. I'll bless you. I'll pour out the blessings. In, the, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Now Jesus said these words. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you met with all. It shall be measured to you again. Now you be stinger, tight water skin flint. A lot of people say stinger. They, they skin a, a flea for his hide and tallow. Now, beloved, listen to me. If you're so stingy that you can't give into God's work, don't you expect God to do anything extra for you in that respect? God said, then you give, and I'm obligated to give back to you. What I want to get across to you today is this thought, and don't you ever forget it. You cannot outgive God. The more you give to God, the more he's going to give back to you in many, many ways. Not only that. But God is a good collector. And you go along and rob God and fail to do what you should do as a Christian. One of these days God send the collector around. And when he gets through collecting you might not have much left. One day a man named John was missing in the church. Somebody said now, where's old John today? He's usually here. Said he's up in the hospital having his ties took out. Now, beloved, I'd rather come and give them my tithes and offerings than have to go to the hospital and have them took out, hadn't you? And so God says he would bless you in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. But this I say, he who so is sparingly shall reap sparingly. You know what that means, don't you? And he who so is boundless shall reap also bountifully. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you may always have all sufficient in all things that are bound to every good work. Now God said you give a little, you're going to receive a little. You go out and sow just a little spot of ground, you're going to reap a little spot. You go out and sow uh, 10 acres, you'll reap 10 acres. God said you give and it'll be given back to you. 
And it's going to be given back to you according to the way you give. And God said, I'll see to that. God promised to see to that himself. That's not in left in the hands of trust of some man. That's in the hands of God. And there's more ways that God can bless you and help you and give to you. If you can sit down and start thinking about some of the good things and what God's done for you and the blessings of God. While well, you never get through telling about all of them. God knows how to do it. And God will do it. And then number six, you're proving the sincerity of your love. I want this to sink in for just a moment. Now you remember back yonder when you was courting that girl and when you first got married and, and shortly after you got married and maybe some still do, you, you couldn't do enough for that woman. Why well, on her birthday you bought her something at Christmas time, she got a nice gift. Oh, that was the most beautiful woman you ever saw. You just loved her to death. Why well, you'd do almost anything for her. You wouldn't like the man that called his girl and said, I'll tell you I I want you to know I love you and I want you to know that I'd do anything in the world for you. I'd swim the ocean for you. I'd give you my last time. You know how crazy I am about you and say if it's not raining, I'll be over to see you tonight. Well, beloved, listen. God knows what we're willing to sacrifice and what we're willing to do to the glory of God. And he tells us here it proves the sincerity of my love. If that man really loved that woman, rain, shine, sleet, snow, hail, storm, or whatnot, he'd have been over there if he'd had to wade the river. But it says, now if it's not raining, I'll be there. You know how crazy I am about you. Well, God said our giving proves our love toward him. People that give love the Lord. People that don't give, the reason they don't give, they don't love God like they should. They love their money. They're too stingy, too tight. And they don't love the Lord and appreciate God like they should. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 through 9, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God insomuch we desired Titus that as he had begun so we would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore as you abound in everything in faith and utterance and knowledge and all diligence in your love to us see that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment by occasion of the fullness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Talking about giving now. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now Paul is saying here, these people here gave, and they kept on giving. That proved their love. Somebody taken up an offering for missions one time, went to an old college and said, Fella, could you give something for the missions? He said, Well, I think I could give $10, it wouldn't hurt. He said, I don't want that. Give $20 so it wouldn't hurt. Now you need to give some time to it hurts and that's the way you get the blessing. Man sitting in the audience one time and the other just taking up the offering and passed the plans around said the man said what are you doing with that money? Oh he said we're supporting Lord's work and we're giving the missions and uh, giving to the heathen and trying to reach them for the gospel. He said I don't believe in that. He said you just take some out because we're giving it to the heathen anyway. Now dear people we need to realize that God blesses a cheerful giver. And you prove the sincerity of your love by what you give and what you do and what you sacrifice for God. You know why a lot of people always find some excuse not to be in church on Sunday? Little Johnny can sneeze, little Susan get a cold, and the whole crowd stays at home to wipe Johnny's nose. You know why? Don't love God like they should. You'd be surprised how many people you find is looking for an excuse. There's some backslidden church members that's got the name on this church over here at Northside. Right now, listen to me at home. If they love God, they'd be in the church. Well, these days, God's going to ring their number. They're going to pick up the phone. It might be God on the other end speaking from the hospital or somewhere. Not in person, but through individuals. God knows where they live. He knows the street to live on. He knows how much money they're making. He knows uh, they don't go to church like they ought to and don't serve God like they ought to. And God's not overlooking these things. One of these days, God's going to pay them a visit. That's right. I mean members of this church right now sitting at home. That's right. You listen. Don't cut that radio off. You listen to your pastor. You're right there listening to me. And you know I'm telling you the truth. One day, God's going to knock on your door. And God's going to collect. And when he does, he's going to collect with interest. Maybe double. Better obey God. You better wake up. God knows your number. And the reason you're not in God's house, you say you're saved, you want to go to heaven and want your family to go to heaven, but you don't love God enough to get up and come to church on Sunday morning. You know I'm telling you the truth. 
Now God wants us to obey Him. Now if we don't do it, then of course uh, it displeases the Lord. We have all kind of ways of giving today. We have the flint, the spines, and the honeycomb. You take the flint, you have to heat it with a piece of metal to get a spark out of it. While you take the spines, you've got to squeeze that to get anything out of it. But you take the old honeycomb, it just drips that honey out. Now that's what God wants His children to do, just drip the love of God out in your heart. Be willing to do that that you should give, or should do. And then number seven, you're obeying the plain command of the Scriptures. I'm not asking you to do something to trade this book. I'm asking you to obey this book. God says in Matthew 3.10 to give. He says in Matthew 23.23, give. He says in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, upon the first of the week, let every one of you, every one of you, every one of you, he said. Not just mama, not just papa, not just daddy, not just uh, the sister or brother. He said, every last one of you that are saved, if you have an income, you're obligated to give. That's what he said in the Bible. And then the next thought is, you're doing your part as a Christian. You know, I've always wanted to do my part. I have been in some time, you know, go to her cafe to eat and, and uh, the, the lady come around and collect the bill and some of these tight wads, they stand around and, and fumble and fumble until you pay the bill and uh, they make it like trying to find a pocket, but you can't find it. That's bad, isn't it? I've always wanted to do my part. I say, now wait just a minute, I'm going to do my part here. You're not, you're not going to do your part in mine. I'm gonna do, I want to do my part. I've always wanted to do my part. Always, when I had that obligation. There may be a time when you go out with somebody, they want to do something for you. I'm, that's a different story. But when five men go out and they sit down and they eat and all oh, each one respected to pay his own bill. And one jaybird, he out fumbles the other four and somebody has to pay his bill. Why well, you think that's uh, pleasing to those fellows? He, he's not willing to do his part. You have a lot of fumblers. They, they can out fumble somebody in that respect. And you have them in the church. A lot of people, the ushers go by too quick. You can't quite get to the pocketbook, you know, and out fumble the usher, and he's gone. And they say, well, I'd give if he hadn't been so fast going by. Well, you can get up and come down. You can give after we dismiss the plates down here on the table. A lot of people like try to out fumble of their responsibility, but you don't out fumble God. God is looking on. So you're doing your part as a Christian. There was a man one time uh, talking to a fella about... Uh, uh, going to church. He said, why don't you go to church, fella? He said, well, the dying thief, he went to heaven. He didn't go to church. He said, well, why don't you give something in the work of the Lord? He said, well, the dying thief said, uh, he went to heaven. He didn't give anything. He said, well, I know, but said, he's a dying thief and you're a living thief. I'm trying to get you straightened out. Now, the Bible says you're laying up treasures in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust does grow up, but where thieves break not through and steal. Every time you give to God, you lay up treasures in heaven. He said, lay up treasures, yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does grow up, where thieves do not break not through nor steal, for your treasures, there your heart will be also. Great and beautiful princess of uh, Sweden, many years ago, she took her diamond rings off and her diamond earrings and all of her jewelry. And she took those beautiful diamonds and she sold them and built a hospital for people to come and be helped. And one day she's walking through that hospital and a young lady came up and said to this queen, said, you know, when I came to this hospital, I was sick and unsaved. And since I've been here, God has saved me and I'm now much better. And tears begin to trickle down her cheeks. That queen said, you know what I saw? I saw my diamonds flowing down her cheeks. She had been saved in that hospital. You can't outgive God. Then last of all, the way you should give and surprises you receive by doing so, and I, I say this hurriedly and I'll be through. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 that your first fruits belong to God. The first part of your income, not what's left over. When I was a boy, we used to feed the hogs and my mother and dad caught slop in the hogs of what's left over now. You don't have to slop God with your leftovers. God wants the first fruits. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of all thy increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Be consistent in giving. Don't give in spurts. Be consistent in giving. As your income is, be consistent in giving. And give, God will bless you if you give the tithe. 
If you want a greater blessing, give above your tithe. Give gifts. When you give the tithe, you're giving God his part. When you give above your tithe, that's a love offering. You give it to the Lord because you love him. Give God a love offering in addition to your tithe. See what happens. And this I say in closing. Here's some of your surprises that you're going to get. You're going to be surprised at how easy it is to give your tithe. See, the devil make it look hard, but you're going to be surprised how easy it is. And then you're going to see how far nine-tenths will go. You're going to be surprised how far the nine-tenths will go. Then you're going to be surprised how you'll grow spiritually. And you're going to be surprised how you can see the blessings of God in your life. And you're going to be surprised at the ease of your own conscience when you know you're doing what you should. And you'll be surprised at the amount you'll be given when you count it up at the end of the year. And you're going to be surprised at the judgment seat of Christ and how God will reward you for what you've done. And God keeps a record of every dime you give as a Christian. Make up your mind right now you're going to do that which is right. Give God his part, which is 10%. That's God's tithe. And then above that, give God gifts and offerings and see what God will do for you. Thank you. You've listened well. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Father, today in the lovely name of Jesus, God, we brought this message to help thy people. We want to help your children. We want to tell them what is right from wrong and what to do and what not to do. And I pray, my God, that you'll take this message today and bless this people. And we know if they'll abide accordingly when they come to the end of this year, they can look back and say, thank God I did that which was right. God have your way. Bless, lead, God and direct as we give this invitation in Christ's name. Amen. Now as Debbie plays softly or stands her soul, if you're in this building unsaved, backslidden on God, or you want to join this church, you want to come forward for any reason, I want you to obey the Lord while she plays or stands her soul.